good afternoon, everybody. Um, before I would start, I want to introduce our institute, the Institute for Security and Safety at the Brandenburg University of Applied Sciences. So Institute was founded in 2012, um, asked by uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency to, to support them after the Stuxnet um, incidents happened, uh, they ran nuclear plants. And we, so we supported this nuclear um, field, this nuclear sector for a couple of years. Later then, we supported the energy grids and um, the, the cybersecurity regulations for energy. And as you can imagine, there is no room for flaws, neither in uh, nuclear sector nor in the cyber grids, in the energy grids. So our area of expertise is cybersecurity and energy and also in automotive. So we started to support UNEC in 2019, um, but we are more or less looking from outside to the sector and to the cybersecurity regulation. And I try to give you today an overview of our thoughts from that, uh, from that perspective. Uh, we also are involved in a couple of international activities. Um, I don't want to go through all of them, but want to mention the first one. So we are working with UNEC and, and also with ITU. Uh, so we are in Center of Excellence of ITU Academy, but we are also working with uh, OEWG, that's the open-ended working group on cyber norms and on international level, which is directly run under the General Assembly of the United Nations. Uh, and that is important. I will come back to it later. First of all, every time when I have to do with a cybersecurity framework or cybersecurity regulation, uh, and session two says this, vehicle cybersecurity framework is ready, it's time for deployment. I have always the same questions because um, we, can, we can be protected by 99%, but if, if there's a 1% vulnerability, then we might have a problem. So the questions which came up into my mind are, are we ready to deploy on the one hand and is the framework sufficient on the second hand? Let's go and look at the first question. Um, first of all, I think everybody um, has the same understanding when talking about cybersecurity and the new UN R155 regulation when looking to the uh, upper right uh, area saying secure software development, secure hardware development for cars, secure diagnostic systems, this kind of things. So this red box is pretty much uh, focusing on cybersecurity in cars. But the UN regulation also says that it's applicable to development, production, and post-production, which means, literally sp spoken, that also the green part should be, should be focused on. So, which means cybersecurity in production, and because the car is produced uh, by the manufacturer. But that extends now the view from only looking to the car and probably car communication to the production environment. So we have to secure the production environment, or is it a question? And if we look to engineering, for example, and engineering workstations and the development process of cars, we also have to look to the, uh, to the blue box or blue boxes, because now it comes to business IT. Uh, backend systems are also business IT when operating cars. And so we have all these different security domains, which uh, by today are not integrated in companies. So my, my understanding and my experience from talks with this or work for, in the sector is that these are distinguished um, organizational units and they are not working together. Probably business IT has, has, has implemented an information security management system according to ISO 27001 which is often seen in, in such kind of, of companies. On the other hand, we have now the UNR155 uh, for the red box, but what, for, what, what do we have for the green box, for example? Yeah? And, and the UNICE regulation does not um, say anything about cybersecurity threats against production systems. Yeah, so, we, so, so I think we have different scopes, we have overlapping scopes, we have probably overlapping responsibilities in the companies working on these topics. And the question can, uh, arise, um, which kind of integrated processes we need, for example? Is, is there one standard which can cover all? Are there different standards which have to be integrated into each other? That are questions which will come up. Um, and now, okay, we have this UNECE regulation. 
yeah, which will be um, um, be a delegated act on, on EU level, and then for European uh, scope comes to the OEMs. And as said, the OEMs have probably an ISMS uh, run by today, and now they have to implement in CSMS, the cybersecurity management system, which is fine, which makes sense. So we have from, from the German Automotive Association, there is a red book uh, explaining a little bit how to implement the CSMS. So OEMs have their part. They are pre-audits and they are support, fully supported more or less. But what's about the suppliers? Now, the suppliers, they are not really aware of, of this new UN regulation. And it has to do with the fact that this regulation comes from UN level, you know, far away from where the suppliers are working today. And the discussions I have now nearly every week with suppliers are, so how come how, how are coming this, this new cybersecurity regulations down to the different supply levels? Is it by using contracts? Is it by using requirements? Is it by using tools like we have in Germany, the TISAX uh, methodology, you know, which now covers information security, prototype protection and data protection. So should we add something there, uh, which, which is more or less a um, uh, manufacturer auditing? Uh, so, so that are questions which we are now discussing also with our institute. Within this week, we have, a, we have an expert round on the table discussing between OEM and between supplier what is needed you know, to, to have it. And even if, if we have that, the, the next question is, now we have the regulation, and probably the regulation is understood, and, and it's clear how it comes to the supplier, do have the competences. And that is, of course, the next question. So UNR155 says competent personnel with appropriate cybersecurity skills and specific automotive risk assessment knowledge is needed. But if you go to Annex 5, look deeper into the measures and think about what measures are there and how they are probably implemented, it's, it's really first, it's clear that we, have, that we need people with high sophisticated cybersecurity knowledge. And so, so that is, for me personally, that is one of the biggest challenges we have because there is this timeline, we have mid of 2024 as a deadline, so to say, and uh, we need people who engineered and produced electronic architectures based on this measures, based on risk analysis, threat analysis on this kind of, of measures. So I think that's a really big, big uh, challenge. And so from our point of view, competence analysis and uh, development of appropriate methodologies are the answer to that. Now looking to the second part of, of my questions, is this framework sufficient? Um, and with sufficient, I mean, does it cover everything which, which it should cover or is there, are, are there boundaries? How, how far is the scope going? Um, so in the middle, we see development, production, post-production. That are the main processes, that are the words which are in the UN regulation. But what's about the supply chain? So the steps before, looking to hardware and software. We know that there are big challenges in securing hardware and software. I'm not sure if you know that uh, even on the hardware side, there are so many hardware trojans in between that there is no own categorization of this type of, of trojans and attacks. And so, so we have a big challenge on the hardware and software side, how to produce secure hardware and secure software. Then of course, as discussed, coming to company from the development processes through production to post-production, which, which more or less means operating. And operating also means the car is driving. The car is driving in cities. If you think about smart cities and smart projects, the car has to be an, an integrated part of a smart city concept. Yeah, and also the charging infrastructure are interesting because charging infrastructure that are more or less parts of the energy network. And I talked to you about you. So I'm, I'm personally working on, on European level much with, uh, with the energy uh, sector and in DG Energy. And what we are looking from that point of view is that um, the, 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 the networks has to be developed in the same way as needed for such kind of, um, of, of automotive development. Yeah, so, so at the World Economic Forum and in, in our working group there, uh, we calculated how many cars, how many cars has to be hacked to, to um, bring the whole uh, energy network in Europe down, or at least make it unstable. Uh, so, so that are questions which are coming up and which has to be um, uh, looked at if we are thinking about a reliable and secure infrastructure in Europe or all over the world. 
Uh, so, so cybersecurity will be, and, and I'm really convinced about that, cybersecurity will be a selection criteria in the future on the question, do I buy such a car, do I operate or run such a car? Uh, cybersecurity is a basic for that. Um, and we have seen in the last couple of months, so from December, January, February, March, we have seen two major incidents. On the one hand, solar winds, which was which was a, a attack against the US mostly, um, and the, the other one was uh, Hafnium, which, which was an attack against uh, um, exchange infrastructure. And both of that seems to be nation states or nation, nation uh, sponsored attacks against infrastructures, against systems, against companies. So we have to, if we talk about cybersecurity in a holistic view, it's not good enough to look to one regulation or a couple of regulations focusing on a car or probably supply chain. We also have to look what is the international view on that. And that has to do with the fact or with the question on if we have massive cyber attacks against cars, against energy infrastructures, smart city infrastructures, who is defending? Who is defending in that cases? It's interesting to hear that uh, the reinsurance sector now this year starts to think about an um, exclusion for cyber war. So, so there will be, and, and that's uh, that's their game. Uh, that their aim. They want to have an, an cyber war exclusion by 2022, which means we are all in the situation that we have uh, more or less situation to, to self-defense our cyber infrastructures and, and our cyber uh, um, elements we have, cyber systems. So, so that part working on, this, on, the, on the international level on cyber norms and protection is a part of the puzzle. We cannot start as a manufacturer's level and saying, okay, a manufacturer produce a secure, a secure product by using secure parts and then having a good secure supply chain. It's also a big part looking above this, beyond this, and think about what's in states level, what's going on there, how to protect this, what, what, what is in the automotive ecosystem in this point of view. Yeah. Um, and, and with this, I'll come to the end and, and uh, we'll, we'll give you some ideas on which actions are needed for cybersecurity readiness and sufficiency. So more or less to, to, to give some somehow answers to my first questions. Um, we, we did a couple of things in the past or, or initiated a couple of things, for example, a, a research project in Germany on, on a gener generic digitalized vehicle e architecture um, as a digital twin on an automotive cyber range. And so, so that will be or hopefully a research project starting next year. Yeah, so, so we need that for testing, for development, for forensics, uh, for training, for all these purposes, and because we cannot hack cars and find out how it's going. So we need this, this kind of element. We need also, and I addressed this in my talk, capacity building in automotive and uh, probably generic curriculum design, you know, which, which fits to UNR 155. And also guidance is implemented, uh, is needed. Um, we did uh, such a document for the German automotive sector, especially for the suppliers, because they are waiting for uh, for good good information on, on how they should implement uh, supply chain and what this cybersecurity management system needs um, me, um, uh, means for them. And, and also I would add to that the so multi-stakeholder dialogue on cyber yeah, in the vehicle ecosystem and the national initiatives on security and sustainability in cyber, uh, which are also part of a su successful um, development on future network cards. So that was it from my side. Thank you very much. And I will give back to Marco. Thank you very much, Guido. You've, <clears throat> you've definitely outlined uh, some of the, of the major concerns and major issues that, that uh, we're going to have to address. Um, just listening to you, and I have, have had the, the, the opportunity to review your presentation uh, before and your thoughts. Um, it does sound to me like the answer to the, the questions that you're that you've posed um, that we're not really ready for deployment. Is that is that your conclusion or is that sort of intermediate conclusion? What is it? That yeah, so 
It was not my intention to answer this both questions because I think we have the panel with a lot of, of really uh, um, renowned experts in this field. Huh? Uh, so so I'm, I'm not really, I'm not sure if I'm in the position to say uh, this, this will fail in any case. No, it, it will not. I only want to address that we have to look for, or have to, to look at a holistic approach, that we have to have things in mind, especially if you start in that phase where you have a new regulation, you're only focusing on what the regulation is saying yes. and probably not looking to, okay, there are other areas which have to be developed in the same time. Or if you take 2024, how far or is there a cybersecurity regulation on the energy side, yeah, which is directly connected to the car? The car is part of an energy network. So mm. is, is, is that going in the same direction? Is it going in the same uh, uh, speed? You know? Is it synchronized at some points? How does ecosystems talk to each other? And that is what I want to make, want to, want to make uh, uh, aware that these questions are really important. Yeah, because so, 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 car does mean we need on the one hand energy and we need on the other hand communication. Yeah, and that things have to be there if you want to be successful. The other thing you you mentioned, and, and this is uh, this is a very important uh, aspect. Those of us who are working in the in the automo automobile industry understand that the 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 job of the of the automotive OEMs right now is as much coordinating as it is assembly. There's some manufacturing yeah. is being done, it's, and it's being distributed all over the world and different types of of, uh, of delivery chains. Uh, but you said that you don't feel that the that the suppliers are yet part of the the picture. That they that you you've met suppliers who don't seem to understand that this is going to happen. This must happen. It's going to be as from from those in those countries where type approval is required. Um, that this will be. Uh, a requirement for having a vehicle, putting a vehicle on the on the road. Um, what needs to be done to get the suppliers into this this picture? I would say we need two things. On the one hand, we need the competences on the supplier side that they are able to understand what to do. On the other hand, we need a mechanism uh, or instruments on how are coming the, the, the cybersecurity requirements into the processes of the supplier. Until today, if I talk to them, they're saying, okay, sometimes there are coming um, fun functional requirements or safety requirements from the OEM, and they are not sure if cybersecurity is inside if, you know, or if that are cybersecurity requirements according to the UN regulation. So there's no clear understanding on how that goes. That, and that is, that's exactly why we have to discuss which way that should go, you know, which instruments are there that, that, it's, that it, it must be clear to the supplier what he has to do. They are only producing what the customer will, will need. Do you think the OEMs need to be doing more for, yeah. to, in, to ensure that, that the suppliers know what they're supposed to be doing? Yeah, they have to do more. And yeah. uh, we have the problem that or the, the suppliers I talk to, they fear that every OEM interprets the, the UN regulation in a different way and uh, the, uh, the requirements also in a different way. Uh, so that a supplier says, okay, I'm, I'm getting requirements from OEM one and from the same more or less requirements from OEM two, but one is, is focusing on measures. The next one is focusing on security processes. Uh, and so I'm, 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 I, I'm not able to implement what, what is needed or what, what my customers are Want it, want it to me yeah, because it's mm. or it's too expensive to implement that. The uh, your institute is is I know it's not just focused on 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 Germany because of you know yeah. there people can come from everywhere but you seem to have a, a very a very close contact with the uh, with the OEMs who are in Germany. Are there other institutions like yours that are doing similar work? that you're cooperating with because this has to cover all 27 countries within the eu at least from the type approval europe side and then there's a the type yeah. approval in japan and south korea and so on but are there other institutions that that you're cooperating with that can sort of make sure that we're covering all of the oems not just the german oems yeah so so we are we started in 
November with our first roundtable discussion because we saw that the suppliers are not aware of this UN regulation, especially smaller ones. And now this week on Thursday, we have our second roundtable where we, where we uh, invited them and, and then that's more or less open for every OEM, but it's in German. So, but, but every OEM is welcome yes. and the supplier is welcome. And we want to discuss this. And there, there are other universities which are more on the automotive and technical side. Yeah, so, so the research pro project we initiated was together with a, uh, with a, um, a Castle University of Applied Science and together with KIT. Um, and, and Bosch is in there and Impinion is in there. So, so we are thinking about that, but um, I, I, I don't know exactly if there is a European and international activities going on there. So, so because for, for us, it's, it's our first major step going into automotive while seeing that this need is there in Germany. Yeah? So I'm, I'm not really aware of how it, how it looks from a French perspective or for Japan perspective. Yeah? But we are open to cooperate internationally with all institutes. Yeah. I want to thank you. At this point, there would be great applause for the for your keynote presentation. I really appreciate your taking the time to and participating uh, in the symposium. And uh, we'll look forward to to in a year's time all the work that's been done by your institute uh, and and reporting on that. Thank you again very much. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Michael, and thanks to everybody that you and you and SE.